the session uh, on social responsibility of science. Uh, you know, this is really a very important uh, time in history where science has to step up and do the job so that uh, we really get this human security for all and that not uh, thousands are dying every day in the Middle East, in the Ukraine, in Africa, in other countries. Uh, also, like the prime minister in Slovakia has been shot yesterday, so hopefully he will be alive and healthy. So. Uh, it's really like uh, the times are uh, such that scientists have to uh, really stress the social responsibility and step up so that we kind of overcome all the craziness in the today's world. And oh, Eva is already inside, I see. Okay, this is perfect. Uh, so, anyway, first I would like to welcome all our panelists. So, uh, first, it's uh, uh, our honorary president, uh, uh, Professor Ivo Schlaus. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Fadva, uh, who is also a member of Board of Trustees, uh, in addition to being a fellow. Uh, another fellow is Jalal Ezin uh, from Tunisia. Uh, and then we have another fellow, uh, Uras Zvelber from Slovenia. And also our uh, editor of uh, Cadmus, uh, Ranjani Ravi. Uh, so. Welcome everybody, also everybody else who is listening to this session. Uh, and just in order to give some um, outline of the session, I'm just going to show like a really short uh, uh, PowerPoint so that we get some feeling on what is uh, uh, actually our task today. We talk about social responsibility of science. Uh, and here, as I said, it's a really crucial time in the history of uh, humanity. Uh, what we talk about is the social responsibility of science uh, and the role of World Academy. And how can World Academy play even bigger role uh, in this field? We all know that this uh, computers are like a new way of communicating and they are gaining power like exponentially every two years. They double. Uh, and this is actually a great opportunity, but also it is... Uh, well, uh, it can help us, like, like in science, it can help us discover equations, develop new science, new materials, new uh, health uh, uh, topics, and everything that can help uh, society. Like, for example, protein structures, it's only a few years that computers can calculate it before it was like a tedious uh, millions of uh, euros. Uh, task, but now you can do it. They can do it almost instantly. Uh, and also, this human machine integration you know, there, is, there has been a human that has been uh, had the chip in the brain for a couple of months and it's helped him uh, against uh, uh, the illness. And uh, this can be used in the future. You know, uh, for the first time in history, humans can get smarter. You know, for the past two, three thousand years, our intelligence was about the same, but now we can get smarter. So, this is a really an opportunity to do better science. And uh, if, if you look at this task, like the task the computers that are making, uh, the human performance is here on top, uh, which means that uh, computers are learning faster and faster, and they can do more and more useful stuff. And we jo if we join forces with computers, we can do even more than that. Uh, so how can we do it uh, that science fiction becomes reality? What remains for the humans? It remains for us to know, to do, uh, to live together. Uh, and to be to just to be humans, it's like the four pillars of education from UNESCO. But what are the da dangers? I mentioned there are like wars, people are dying, and as you can see here, this graph is not perfect, but it can show you that uh, following the great advances, more or less in the previous century, at the beginning of this century, something happened, and the democracy uh, started to have troubles, and they have even larger troubles today. So what can we do is the question. And uh, there are challenges, like one of the challenges is stop all wars now. I think Eva will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and uh, there is also going to be a petition on change.org. Uh, then uh, even more important, to change the hearts and minds of people all over the world. Uh, because uh, that's where the change happens, inside the heart, inside the mind. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, there's also this topic of competency development. If people develop our competency, then we can do more and better for each other. And this could provide freedom for everybody. And there are lots of other ideas. So I would now like to ask uh, Eva to start sharing the first set of ideas. And... Uh, So it, it's uh, our honor to have the first uh, panelist, uh, our honorary president. He's been a physicist in uh, high energy physics for quite a long time. We have cooperated with him a lot, and uh, he has really great ideas, both in physics and in uh, humanity. 
and he likes to serve humanity. He has had all sorts of functions in so many academies, the Club of Rome, even in the Croatian Parliament. So, uh, so it's really our great pleasure to give the floor to Ivo. Thank you very much. It is indeed a great pleasure to share some of my thoughts uh, related to the issue of the social responsibility of science. Let me start with something that usually is forgotten. Namely, uh, it was already uh, more than 2,000 years ago that Aristotle said, all men by nature have a desire to know. So actually, we have this imperative of knowing more and more. Uh, we do believe uh, that we know quite a lot. And as a matter of fact, when we look on uh, the progress of science, we see that every five years, uh, the knowledge uh, doubles. When we look at the various technical things, uh, the progress is even faster. Some area, like for instance the Moore's law, uh, imagine uh, how the situation would be if there would be no quantum physics in chemistry. We would not understand Mendeleev system in medicine. There will be no Rankin. There will be no computerized tomography. Nothing of these things will be available. So uh, progress is going on. So. Uh, the idea is sometimes heard, uh, let us stop science so that we do not interfere by bringing more and more dangerous technology is wrong. Though there are few persons like uh, Rothblatt, like uh, Sacristani, like a group of people uh, initiated by Leo Szilard that proposed various things uh, about scientists stopping to do uh, research, which could be dangerous. There are, on the opposite side, more and more of those who will and are actually doing research that leads to very dangerous consequences. So, A, science is important. B, we absolutely do not, do not have enough of scientific research. As we always know the story that uh, more than 100 years ago, Kelvin said, uh, oh, we understand everything, there are two minor clouds, and then these two minor clouds turn to quantum physics and theory of relativity. Then recently, we had actually what we called the standard theory, and that we realized the standard theory covers just 5% of our universe. The rest we do not understand. So yes, absolutely the imperative is we have to do much, much more in research, in education. Uh, one consequence is that all countries should devote considerably more of human power and uh, GDP uh, to science and research. So this is the first conclusion. The second actually that I want to point out is that usually one would like to say, aha, let us pick those areas which are the most important. All of the studies show that actually all of the scientific disciplines from A to Z, from anthropology to zoology, are necessary that they do not really uh, progress in such a way that we can say, aha, now let us forget about uh, a biology, let us focus on uh, physics, or let us forget about history or archaeology. We do need absolutely everything. However, uh, all of these things that we do need are faced with the following problem. We are faced, as Sandy said at the beginning, with most dangerous time in the history of human time. Why the most dangerous? Because we are destroying our natural and our human capital. And we do know 
that within roughly two decades we will destroy this planet. And then in order to augment the problems that we already have, we are actually decided to get involved into totally unnecessary, stupid war, which now has this connection involving Europe, Middle East, Africa, and very likely uh, most of the world. And the characteristic of this is that while we have still at our disposal to, to possibly three decades, the case of war, uh, there is a now we will destroy the world in less than a few days. The imperative is to focus on this necessity. And the question is what science can do. A lot of things. On one side of the various technical, technological advancements, and to the other, the domains which are extremely important, namely economy and politics, are far, far from where they should be. Again, back to Aristotle, politics is a must of science. In our case, this is not. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the progress of politics is much less than in any other domain. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, dear Eva. Uh, Professor Schlaus for this wonderful introduction, which has inspired us. Uh, and I believe we should now just move on. So each of the panelists will have a short presentation. The next one uh, is Professor Uros Zwerber, who, who has been a professor for nanosciences at Jozef Stefan Institute and Graduate School in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, he's been a researcher in uh, nanosciences, nanotechnologies, and material sciences. Uh, he's head of the Department of Gaseous Electronics, uh, and he's member of uh, various uh, academies and of uh, research societies in these fields. Uh, he is also a wonderful supervisor and a very uh, prudent researcher in the field of nanosciences. Uh, so please, uh, uh, Ura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandy. You know, when I was first approached and with this topic, I and asked for a quotation. I put uh, the one which you can see, and I said the science must expand our understanding while ensuring the ethnical boundaries uh, are respected and uh, harmful consequences are mitigated. And in this term, I would like to relate to nanotechnology, which is my field of research. Uh, I think nanotechnology uh, in general holds unprecedented uh, control over matter at atomic and molecular scale and holds uh, as well immerse potential to revolutionize our uh, lives from healthcare to energy and from electronics to environmental sustainability. There's a large uh, promise here. So with the end, with this great power comes also great responsibility. Uh, and this has also an ethnical implication of nanotechnology, which should not be uh, overstated. So the social responsibility of science, with the re referring to the use of nanotechnology, encompasses basically a broad spectrum uh, of uh, everything from spanning from environmental stewardship to equitable access to benefits, ethnical use of technology, and mitigation of potential risk, which might materials, uh, nano nanomaterials pose. Uh, so the, one of the foremost areas that actually I believe nanotechnology can contrib contribute to society well-being is through a pursuit of a green agenda. This has been very well stated in European Union through the European Green Deal, uh, which is aimed at achieving carbon neutrality as well as sustainable development. And this actually is leading toward great aided advances in nanotechnology. For instance, nanomaterials can be utilized to, more, to build more efficient solar panels, 
uh, that can be used to leading to increase renewable energy generation. Similarly, nanotechnology holds promise in advancing energy storage system, enabling widespread ado adoption of uh, renewable energy uh, resources, as well as addressing inter uh, meeting uh, agencies uh, uh, issues. Uh, and in this realm of uh, nanotechnologies uh, is also nanoelectronics. Uh, as we saw in the beginning when uh, uh, Alexander was presenting his, his uh, slides, you see that actually nanoelectronics and the social uh, responsibility lies in promoting accessibility to affordability alongside innovation. Uh, so nanoelectronics can or, and have potential of revolutionizing the computing, communication, data storage, leading to more efficiency devices at lower energy consumption. However, it is crucial to ensure that the benefits of these advances are accessible to all segments of society. Bridging the digital divide and preventing further marginalization of unprivileged communities. So we need to take into account this issue very well. Uh, one of the things which also stands out and will stand out is healthcare. Uh, you know, so here nanotechnology poses a great uh, and has profound, great potential and has profound implication. Nanomedicine, for example, offers opportunities to more precise diagnostic, uh, diagnostics. We have targeted drug delivery. We have personal, personalized treatment strategies. We have very quick, actually, uh, testing of uh, different viruses, which can be much faster used to adopt ourselves for something like it was, uh, uh, you know, pan a recent pandemic. So we can much quickly uh, found the, the 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 ways how we can actually uh, detect the viruses, in the, the identify the viruses, and develop new drugs uh, and and strategies how to treat them. On the other hand, if you're looking at the Green Deal, environmental sustainability is a cornerstone, a cornerstone of a social responsibility of science and nanotechnology. While nanomaterials hold this, all these great uh, promises, you know, pollution remediation, water purification, sustainable agriculture, and their, their environmental impacts must be thoroughly evaluated. Nanoparticles, namely, are released in the environment without accurate safeguards can pose a risk to ecosystem and human health. So it's a, although it's a promise, it's on the other side, can have negative implication. And we need to take an account. And before this, you know, this, the responsibility of research practices, we need to put into cycle, life cycle assessment and the risk mitigation strategies, as well as developing all this, the, 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 this means. So furthermore, the social responsibility of science and nanotechnology extends ethnical considerations surrounding labor practices, intellectual property rights, and geopolitical implication. It is imperative to foster uh, something like inclusive and transparent research environment that promises collaboration, knowledge sharing, equitable uh, distribution of benefits for all the, the world around. So this we need to take into account this. Moreover, this international cooperation is essential to address those global challenges. So we need to work together, something what we saw in the first slides as well. Uh, and this is the only way how we can actually combat the climate change, public health issues, and resource scarcity. These are actually the most important things. So in a conclusion, I would say that basically the science social responsibility in terms of using nanotechnology encompasses multifaceted approach that prioritizes environmental sustainability, uh, uh, equitable access to benefits, ethnical use of technology, and mitigation of potential risks which need to be taken in account. By embracing all those principles, scientists and policymakers on the other side can harness the nanotechnology uh, transformative potential and build more prosperous and uh, equitable and sustainable future for all of us. And that would be my last statement. Thank you.
many thanks, dear Urash, Professor Svelber, for wonderful ideas for transformation that are really so much needed. Uh, if anybody wonders what is this picture behind me, that's Joseph Stefan, Slovenian physicist, uh, who discovered the black body radiation law in the 19th century. That was one of the two small challenges in physics that later led to the quantum physics. So, so that's how it happens, you know. So a small uh, challenge that nobody knows how to answer and then some big theory applies. And our next panelist uh, is uh, Padva El uh, Gwindi. Uh, I, I believe actually she doesn't need introduction, but still I will say a few words. Uh, she is an Egyptian-American anthropologist, a former professor of anthropology at Qatar University, uh, author of several ethnographies. Uh, she's been the member, uh, the fellow of uh, WASP for quite some time and also uh, the, the member of Board of Trustees. Uh, and she has held various uh, positions in different uh, mainly American universities, uh, and uh, we look forward to your presentation, Farva, please. Um, you know, as we look, we have two regions with very destructive wars in the Ukraine and in Palestine, and uh, we look at the skies and we see drones and missiles going all over the place. And we, I, I really wonder whether the uh, fiction of Star Wars has become a reality or was it already establishing what even the Academy cannot establish, which is a, an agenda for the future and we are the future. It is important to recognize that the global landscape and the power structure has dramatically changed. And... Um, thought leaders, including uh, many in the academy, are really need to catch up a little bit with what's happening in the world today. Uh, I suggest we need a new UN Charter 2024, not a revised charter, but a new charter, because the charter was based on a very different situation after the Second World War. Um, the charter should reflect the change in the balance of power in the world today uh, and inclusion, inclusion of East and West in the world, North and South, all these countries and member states should be um, strongly represented and perhaps a rethinking of the, the veto power, which has been uh, not, it's, it's really irrelevant today in today's world. Um, I also want to point out that our views of whether science is good or bad or should be applicable or not applicable, should have responsibility or not, are really obsolete. We are often blurring science with the scientists, and we separate science from indigenous knowledge, which is often indigenous knowledge is often applied science. Uh, scientists, many scientists as we know, choose to collaborate with destruction, and this should be monitored. Um, drones, uh, from my uh, first-hand experience in Qatar, archaeologists were trying to use drones for archaeological research. Of course, they were, uh, the state didn't uh, approve it easily or approve it at all, I don't remember, uh, because of worry for spying which is not an issue anymore because we the whole world is being spied on from a distance. Um, so we know that drones can be used for beneficial knowledge, but we are using it for destruction that is unheard of. But of course, we don't use, we don't necessarily need drones and missiles because we can achieve pacification or forced dislocation of people by uh, simply st weaponizing starvation. People talk about, um, in many sessions, we have sessions on food security. Uh, what if we use food against the people? The food was secure, it was available, but it's used against them. Why? Because we want them to move. And if they move, then we can have their piece of land. Um, as I said, intelligence and spying, which used to be you need someone there to, uh, you know, 
go in and move and get the interview and and spy on 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 administrators and politicians and military people you don't need to be there anymore uh, the the drones are doing a very good job of spying and sending the messages back so that's how technology is uh, being used regular armies are now be, not replaced by, along with regular armies, we have um, employing mercenaries, mercenaries who kill and die for causes they do not understand. Um, so I would like to say science should not be blamed for all that. I am a believer that science must go on Exploring, exploration, discovery, systematic data, imagination, inspiration, it should go on. Scientists who violate the codes of morality and ethical standards of their own fields must be monitored and must be remembered and must be publicized, even though that's an invasion of privacy. But we have to separate the two because we have a problem with scientists who are lured by money. I know many cases in anthropology in which their knowledge, which is very valuable about the culture of a people, is being exploited by intelligence services and by military services to control, to torture, and stuff like that. So. Um, in, and also when we talk about aligning application of science and technology, I would say you have to align it with people's needs, which requires a recognition of different cultural traditions, levels of development of different countries, demographics of a country, a country with 100 million, 200 million is different from a country with about you know, 200,000, 300,000. They always um, talk about the educational system in uh, Finland, which is not really applicable to India. It's not applicable to Egypt or anywhere else. We have to really be critical of them. So we have to take cultural traditions, levels of development, demographics of a country, level of education, all in consideration. I would like to conclude with... Um, the scientist in the crib. The scientist in the crib is actually the name of a book that was very popular decades ago. And I keep thinking of that toddler in the shower where his parent is, uh, he or she is bathing him. And the toddler sees water coming down the tap and tries to hold it. What we do with that makes a big difference. Do we cultivate this curiosity and make a scientist be interested in matter and the nature of matter and how to be use matter? Or we stop him and crush him or her and therefore stop the science. Science is neither good or bad one should have no responsibility. It's amoral. It is about research. And um, it is those who apply it. The military, the uh, politicians, uh, the even the, um, the capitalists, let's say. All those who have interest in abusing science and misapplying science, but we do not want to blame science for all the evils in the world. Thank you. Many thanks, dear Fadwa, for this deep insight, uh, which will make, I think, our repertoire's life quite difficult to capture everything. And still, uh, there are really a lot of uh, deep truths that uh, we need to abide by. And uh, hopefully this will help everybody to live better science in the future. And now we can move on to our next panelist. Our next panelist is Professor Jalel Ezin uh, from the, the University uh, University of Tunis. Uh, he's professor 
uh, of system theory and control, and he has a really a good history of uh, working in international organizations, a civil servant. Uh, he's been chairholder of the UNESCO chair on science technology innovation policy, advisory board member of the UNESCO science report 2020, and founding and current president of the Tunisian Association of Advancement of Science Technology and Innovation Think Tank, and of many other uh, important international bodies. Uh, also, uh, senior associate at ICTP member, senior member of uh, IEEE, and a lot of uh, other uh, important uh, functions. Uh, so th that's why we are really very happy to have you with us. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be uh, with my colleagues, fellows uh, here in this uh, conference. And I would like, of course, to congratulate uh, WAS for its uh, 64th uh, conference. And uh, as uh, most of you probably know, this is uh, my first year as a fellow and my first uh, uh, participation uh, in WAS conference. Uh, I was following some of, of course, most of the uh, session that uh, took place yesterday and today. Uh, and... Uh, I can tell that uh, I was listening to all of these great people uh, was uh, highly uplifting, and I can tell there is a lot of uh, really uh, uh, sync, uh, you know, synchronization as far as ideas and uh, uh, you know visions uh, among uh, all of these uh, uh, panelists. Uh, so uh, that was really rewarding, and I'm sure uh, whatever is coming will be also as much, if not more. So uh, for my uh, intervention, uh, I wanted, of course, uh, to insist on uh, something uh, very, very important, uh, which is how trustworthy science. We grew up to really trust science. And that's uh, a very, very important issue when we talk about science and uh, how society looks up to science uh, uh, and how uh, uh, trusts uh, science and scientists. That's the general, actually, uh, situation. When we hear about science, we also think of certainty, even though scientists, you know, grow, uh, grow up being more and more uncertain the more they know. Uh, also, we think of modernity, because when we think of modernity, we think of science as being uh, a major uh, pillar of that modernity. And of course, science, technology, and innovation as being the engine of development. So all of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, positively loaded characteristics of science uh, give science its uh, uh, place as well as its tremendous role in somehow fashioning and tailoring uh, uh, the human culture and the human behavior. Uh, and I believe us being here today is uh, uh, you know, a testimony uh, uh, to that uh, uh, role and place science has uh, in, in our civilization. We all know that uh, the founding father of WAS also launched this uh, wonderful project because humanity was undergoing a very, very challenging uh, crisis, you know, be it the Manhattan uh, uh, Project and uh, the nuclear uh, holocaust uh, or uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, the missile crisis uh, but today we are facing these problems and much much more okay and we are even facing you know uh, some uh, anthropogenic existential threats that humanity somehow uh, through its wisdom or the lack of it has generated okay uh, and of course, going back to the trustworthiness of uh, science, uh, the list uh, of the scientific achievements is a long one and keeps growing uh, day uh, by day. Uh, and every one of us has probably his own, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, preferred event or result or uh, achievement uh, of, uh, of science. Also, when we talk about science, uh, we all know that uh, the scientific achievements are, and results find their application in technology. 
okay? So technology usually is the expression uh, of the findings and the results of, uh, of science. So here I really, myself uh, and through my experience in STI policy, I prefer talking about technoscience because really the, uh, uh, the demarcation line between science and technology is becoming so fuzzy and somehow that uh, science and technology feed uh, uh, you know, to each other is becoming really the rule rather than exception uh, today. Now, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, something uh, very, very important uh, about this techno science things. The point that I wanted to really drive home today is that today we see a capture of science. We see a capture of techno science by capital. So we as WAS fellows, we as scientists, uh, if we want to really leverage, you know, uh, uh, science to tackle, to apprehend, uh, you know, our global challenges, we have to understand, you know, who is somehow uh, 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 influencing the sciences through uh, the policies, through the funding, and through uh, uh, also the training and the teaching. And this point to me is fundamental because we talk about science, we trust science as if that science is really ready to answer whatever needs and requests that we make of it as much as we can, you know. But if we understand how science and techno science has been captured by capital maybe roughly speaking, uh, you know, since the 70s, we understand that that capture has uh, uh, molded the science and technology to the advantage of the capital. It, uh, it has been, ex uh, you know, uh, captured to further the power and the wealth of these uh, wealthy and powerful. And I would even uh, say that today's uh, 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 problems, today's uh, existential threats that uh, humanity is facing is due in a large extent to this capture. Because the uh, wealthy and powerful, when they captured science and technology to their own benefits, they really overlooked or even put aside all the challenges and the true challenges that humanity is facing. And they really invested their power, their money to modify regulation, to steer funding so that science works for their benefits and uh, uh, augments and further their power and their, uh, 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 you know, wealth. Today, we all know, for those who are familiar with science, technology, and innovation policy, that these policies are more driven by uh, 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 what we call technology push policy rather than, you know, uh, uh, society needs policy. And that already you know, gives us a clear idea of how science and technology, or better, techno science, is being leveraged for the benefit of the one percent and not for the benefit of humanity as a whole. So, my what Thank I'm you. trying to say here, if we really would like to have science and technology tackle our existential threats, we need somehow to save science and technology from this capture. How to liberate Thank you. science and technology from this capture. And I believe this is one of the greatest, uh, uh, you know, challenges institutions like WAS faces in order to leverage science and technology for, 
you know, the security of all. And I will stop here. Many thanks, uh, dear Jalal, uh, for such profound words of wisdom. That's why we allowed a few minutes more. So now we are going to have to ask Ranjani to make really editor of Karmus, also associate fellow and associate uh, senior research, research associate at uh, Mother Society. Uh, please. Um, hello, all. I'm going to keep this really short. Um, during the plenary session yesterday, Ketan Patel mentioned how we have all the resources we need, the money, the people, the, the knowledge, everything is not at our will. But the only thing that is lacking or um, what we need to do right now is to leverage what we have in order to attain the SDGs. It's not that we don't have the solution. So I'm just going to, you know, when I was thinking about the whole thing, we've already covered all the major points here. So I was just wondering, we already have all the knowledge that we could potentially have. There is still scope for progress, I agree, but um, how we leverage what we have at our disposal matters. And the only thing that we can do right now um, as a network of networks, I'm referring to was here, is to leverage of the leverage the power of the networks that we already have. Come together, you know, join forces and uh, engage people, engage citizens as to you know educate them as to what the role of science is. And uh, Professor Fadwa Gwindi often writes this: how culture is a primary force in education. You know, bring about this awareness that society is the main, it's it's the primary instrument that is needed to understand who we really are, what science is. It's not about some discovery. It's not about, um, you know, uh, academia alone. It's about how science is being used to make sure it addresses the well-being of all, which is you know, uh, what um, Svelbar Uros, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but he was referring to, or Jalil Azin, I'm sorry, but um, the founding fathers of was intended for was to be this agency for human welfare. So how science should be used for the betterment of all humanity and how education as an instrument, as a tool, you know, can be used for consciously transmitting this to the younger generation. So I'm going to end this here. Thank you so much. Uh, many thanks, uh, dear Anjani, also to leave two minutes for the questions. And uh, I see that we already uh, had the first question from our uh, board of trustee member, Jonathan Granoff. And he, he was asking, did wealth and poverty only begin dominating science in the 70s, or has it not always been the case? Uh, and uh, I think we can agree that uh, this is very true. And this is actually our responsibility that we raise up to the challenge and we really make uh, this future science and technology as well a better place in this world so that uh, it's not only that... Uh, uh, we look at the past, but that we look at the present and see what we can do in the future so that uh, the situation improves. I mean, uh, probably it won't improve like overnight or with some miraculous, uh, I don't know, whatever. But uh, if we all strive together to make this a better situation and to really apply science for the good of humanity and for good of all, then we can also contribute both to the real human security for all so that people don't have to run away from the bombs or whatever, or from the uh, fire, but that they can really live peaceful and uh, uh, courageous and also creative lives which contribute to science. And then with this science together, we can make this world a better place. I can, I can mention that this uh, Stop the Wars petition is going to be in the near future published on the change.org and also in the Carmus, but Carmus is now a little later. so. And we also need uh, like better ma means to really stop this violence. You know, this will be like a small contribution, but we need some larger contribution, uh, maybe also from the science. So the scientists invent the ways how to prevent the dictators from using their weapons. And hopefully something like that would also happen in the near future. You know, we have to be open to 
pleasant surprises so that science really does something good we don't know what science will do nobody could have been able to predict what science will do but uh, sometimes science did really something great and uh, we are here uh, to make it happen in the near future to do something great and to make this world a better place